story. That's the Penny Lifeboat story. Also, uh, Seth Lakeman, great folk singer, um, his new album's got a song on it all about the Penny Lifeboat. Which I didn't know. And uh, it's great. It's a really good record. It's it's an extraordinary song. He sang it on this program when he came in a few months ago. Um, And a lot of these stories that you're telling would have, in years gone past, been the stuff of song, wouldn't they? And they'd have been passed on from family to family, from generation to generation, and that's how we'd remember them. Yes, it's, it's this thing about the lore of the tribe. You know, there are certain incidents that take place and people want people want to, to remember uh, certain behaviours, as well as the incident itself, because it reminds them about the, the best qualities imaginable that they, they, they can seek to aspire to. And yes, in poems and in song, for as long as human beings have been able to speak, they have been remembering oral tradition, they remember songs and poetry and stories, the bards tell the stories because it it reminds people who they are, not just as individuals but as a race, as a people, as a nation. They're big, there's nothing like the power of the spoken word. The Penny Lifeboat story, Neil, I think is worth just remind I mean this is early eighties, so this is this yeah. is not a long time ago. Many people will uh, will remember this terrible story. Um just go through the the account as you have it in your book. Yeah. First and foremost, I wanted people to remember that I wasn't suggesting that heroes were were no longer among us. You know, that heroes, of course, are still among us. It's just that we don't pay them as much attention as perhaps we should. Uh, Penley, a crew of eight in the Penley lifeboat, were summoned to assist the eight-strong crew of a, a coaster, a, a, a cargo ship that had got into trouble. Its engines had failed in the English Channel and it was being pushed towards rocks by hurricane-force winds. Uh, the eight men, all volunteers, get into the boat and head off into a hurricane. I mean, most of us wouldn't be able to stand up in a hurricane, but these men decided to get into a 47-foot wooden boat and go out to help people that they knew nothing about and had no obligation to. Amongst the the people in the boat were uh, the skipper's wife and his two teenage daughters. So it wasn't just hardened mariners that were out there, it was children as well. So they go out, the conditions are impossible, uh, with consummate skill, uh, the coxswain of the lifeboat, the Solomon Brown, he's called Trevelyan Richards, he gets his boat alongside. Uh, the boat is thrown by the waves onto the deck of the cargo ship and then it slithers off. And this happens not once but twice. There's a, a Sea King helicopter is hovering above. The weather's so bad it can't commit to the rescue. It but tried to, it tried earlier. It tries on, to it? rescue but it can't, so it can only watch. Uh, the, the US... Uh, Air Force pilot who was piloting it he was on secondment to the to the British forces at that time, he later testified uh, to the inquiry that he watched as the crew came in again and again and again and he said and I quote they were truly the greatest eight men I have ever seen. Eventually Trevelyan Richards got the boat alongside for long enough for four people to jump from the deck of the coaster into the lifeboat but not content with saving half, he came back in again And at that moment, with the helicopter crew looking on and the Falmouth Coast Guard listening on its radio, all went silent. There's a deafening silence from the the radios on the coaster and in the lifeboat. And they realised that something catastrophic has finally happened. Basically, they had got so close to the the rocks of the Cornish shoreline that the rocks got both boats. And all 16 people, the eight lifeboat men and the eight people aboard the Union Star, the cargo ship, were all lost. The very next day, people back in Mousehole, Mousel in Cornwall, which was really the base for the for the lifeboat, boys and men were stepping forward to replace the lost eight men. And amongst them was this was uh, the son of one of the men who'd been lost, and he is now the coxswain of the new Penley lifeboat. Now, that kind of selfless sacrifice to help strangers. You know, if anyone thinks that this is a collection of stories about uh, imperial soldiers mm. stamping the hand of the British Empire, it's not, because there are qualities, exemplified perhaps by the Penley lifeboat men, greater than in any other story in the whole of the book, that are the kind of qualities about men that I think are worth reminding people about. And one of the things that really brings it brings it out, uh, Neil, is that you have... An account. Presumably, this is from the Coast Guard who was listening into the uh, to the radio exchanges. So you have Trevelyan Richards, who's at the helm of the lifeboat, saying, "Do you want us to come alongside and take the women and children?" Now, Morton, he's at the wheel. He's of, the skipper of the cargo right. ship. Yes, please, says Morton. The helicopter is having a bit of difficulty, so if you can pop out and get the women and two children off, I'd be very much obliged. I know. If you could just pop out, 
I'd be very much obliged. It's extraordinary and I put way this, of speaking. I, I put, he was only he was only uh, thirty six years old, the skipper. So a young man, and he's there with his wife and his two stepdaughters, and I, I imagine that they were possibly within earshot of him, so that. Dreadful. Do you think that's why he, he phrased Maybe it like no that? Maybe no one really knows, but I think perhaps they were within earshot and that he felt that what little he could give was to try and reassure them for as long as he could that the situation was man manageable and that the last thing they would want to hear at that time of all times would have been him panicking. But in any case, both Morton and Trevelyan Richards talked to one another very reasonably. There was a, a BBC documentary that marked the 25th anniversary of, of the tragedy and the, 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 the radio transcripts transcripts were replayed and there's no panic in their voices and it's truly humbling that they're not screaming and shouting, they're in the most dire emergency imaginable that ends up with all of their deaths and still they're polite to each other and I just find that kind of uh, composure, that kind of bravery, uh, it just moves me uh, like, like nothing else. Yes, they are quite extraordinary stories and, and, and as you say because you've put the Penley story quite early on uh, in the book it undercuts that feeling that, hang on a sec, you know, is this a, a, a book of uh, Rudyard Kipling, you know, saying that the, you know, if only we were back in the days of the Empire, all of a sudden you're thinking, no, actually, these are ordinary, uh, some of them are from that era, but all, actually there's a lot of these that are ordinary stories about ordinary people doing yeah. extraordinary things under extraordinary pressure, and they don't all end in death. No, and we put ourse you put yourself in the position every time and you think, how would I have handled yes. that situation? And there is something to be taken from hearing how other people have responded to situations of the most catastrophic importance and danger. There's something to be had from knowing that people can behave in that noble way that we should all take pride in, you know, that the human species can be...